Nelson, and I can see there's a new face, some new faces in the room. So um, I thought I'd introduce myself. I help curate experiences at Kudos. Um, so these are for anyone and everybody. The intention of this web series is to continue Kudos's critical mission to connect you with the safari of passions of the folks around you. And this is to spark understanding and to celebrate neurodiversity. Today, our guest, um, Dr. Sohaila Zadrin, is a neuroscientist who studied artificial intelligence and women's health for a decade. So today she's going to take us through a little bit of what she's working on and how artificial intelligence might be shaping your everyday life. Hello. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for arranging this. I'm super excited to be able to speak to such a diverse and neurodiverse community like this. And as your host, Allison had mentioned, I am a neuroscientist by training and a lot of my work is in trying to understand how the brain works. And in the last five years, you know, we have been trying to understand how the brain works and trying to extend those understandings to artificial intelligence and technology. My work has been specifically focused on women's health and wellness and trying to create a platform that women can utilize to really improve the quality of their life and to understand their healthcare. This year, we launched a company called FemPatch2, which I'm an advisor for. And the premise of the company essentially is to be a place for women to purchase products that is related to their, their sort of women's health, as well as have wellness appointments to speak with a scientist or an expert to get answers to some of their questions regarding women's health. We think that understanding and education is going to be incredibly helpful in women trying to create a wellness journey for themselves that's personalized to them. And then a part of what we do is to really kind of create a sophisticated wellness journey by using AI and using artificial intelligence. I'm sure most of you have heard the word artificial intelligence or seen references to artificial intelligence on TV or on, um, uh, on the news or in movies even. It's a concept that, you know, is not new. We've had artificial intelligence as early as the 1950s and the 1960s. But the last five to six years, we've seen an explosion in artificial intelligence. And if you have interacted with an iPhone or typed something into Google, or even, you know, leverage, you know, the face, uh, the face password capabilities of your phone, you've interacted with some, some form of artificial intelligence. And we think that artificial intelligence has a huge role in health, and we are trying to better understand how to use artificial intelligence in health and in wellness. But, you know, one of the things that we are constantly struggling with is one, you know, how do you create a piece of artificial intelligence that's sophisticated? How do you create a piece of artificial intelligence that's actually useful in healthcare and in women's wellness or need just in anyone's wellness? And two, how do you protect the privacy and the information and the health information of patients that are using AI? So for us, you know, we've used artificial intelligence in some capacity throughout our entire platform. Women can come in, they can do a simple questionnaire and based on their questionnaire, we can have a very simple decision tree, which is a type of artificial intelligence to determine what type of products would be best suited for them based on what they input it. Another kind of form of artificial intelligence that I specialize in in neural networks is you know, a way to be able to look at a lot of data and to be able to extrapolate from that data any patterns that may come about and that's a form of AI that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in more detail, because that's the AI that funds my research, that sort of fuels my research and fuels our platform. Most of artificial intelligence is modeled on how the human brain processes information. So when you speak to Siri and she understands what you're saying when you ask a question and she answers in response, is modeled in a very similar way to how the human ear processes sound and information and how the brain takes that information and the sound and correlates it to meaning and then generates a response. 
And when it comes to, you know, visual recognition, like when you go on your app and you try to get into your phone and like the phone kind of screens your face to see if you are the right person and the right owner of the phone, the facial recognition component is very similar to how the human eye actually recognizes the, the human face. Neural networks models how cellular neurons process or our understanding of how cellular units of the brain, the neuron processes information. And the way that this work is that input is given into a system and what ends up happening is the system goes through all of the data and it tries to extrapolate and understand patterns in that data. And then once it identifies a series of algorithms to be able to decipher those patterns, it can actually start executing on those tasks. One of the analogies that I use commonly is, you know, think of a neural network or machine learning as sort of a, a young child, if you will. If a young child is starting to learn the difference between an apple and a banana, one of the things that we do for that young child is we show them all these pictures of apples, thousands and thousands of pictures of apples, apples in trees, apples on the table, apples in a bowl, apples of different colors. And then we show them thousands and thousands of pictures of things that are not apples, pears, bananas, cars, trees. And what this child does is he looks at all of the pictures and he starts to make connections in his brain of, well, you know, apples seem to all, all these pictures of apples seem to have a few things in common. They can be of the same shape. Apples can really be only the same colors. They can only really be of the same kind of, you know, size. And so when the young child creates these um, internal processes in his brain on creating patterns on, you know, seeing commonalities on these pictures, what you can do then is you can start testing this child and be like, well, here's a picture of a bus. Is it an apple or is it not an apple? And if the child correctly identifies the picture as a bus and uh, correctly identifies the picture as a non-apple, then you know that the child has learned and it has created enough understanding of the images to be able to decipher whether or not um, it can determine an apple from a non-apple. AI kind of works in a very similar way. In a computer system, we just add and share a ton of images of a, of a, of a particular data set. And then we send a data set that isn't related to those images. And we hope that the AI can be able to decipher, create pattern recognition in the data to be able to differentiate between what it's like trying to identify when it's not trying to identify. And then you test and to see as an experimentalist if the AI has learned appropriately. And if it does, I think you have something that you can be able to leverage. Our platform in women's health has to do a lot of different things. One, the data we have to create. And so we're actively working on creating wellness appointments that we record with the women's permission so that we have a data set that women can be able to, or as scientists, we can be able to go through and see if there's any patterns in that data. And the hope is eventually we can move towards creating wellness protocols that are a little bit more quantitative, a little bit more sophisticated than anything that exists out there today. And so that is sort of what FemPatch does. And that's a little bit about like the AI that's used. So I do teach and lecture a few courses in AI and there's a couple of things that I use, but there's, if you are interested on in learning about you know, neural networks, interested in learning about how AI works in a very simplified way, I use this book, you know, commonly, you know, Make Your Own Neural Network by Terry Krishi as a really kind of easy, reading to learn more about the industry and learn more about how to be able to do the coding and the mathematics um, behind if you were interested in building your own neural network. With that said, we really know that artificial intelligence, or at least we hope that we know that artificial intelligence can do some really remarkable things in human health and really kind of transform how health is delivered, how healthcare is delivered, how healthcare is managed, how patient-centered care is going to be deployed in the next five to six years. And we're, as a team, very excited to be actively engaged on a research front as well as on a startup front to be able to go after this. So with that said, I'm gonna end my sort of you know, spiel and then I take, can take questions about my work, my platform, and any other questions you guys might have. And I'm happy to answer any questions around neuro wellness 
anything that I still remember from my PhD around neuroscience and how the brain works, and then any, answer any questions you guys might have on my thoughts on the future of AI and healthcare. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. A lot of new information for me that I took in. Um, does anybody have anything that they wanted to dive deeper into or was curious about what was um, just shared right now? Mm -hmm. um, my first question is, which, uh, uh, which part of my brain makes negative, makes ne negative thought? So are you saying which part of your brains give you like negative thoughts? Yeah. Huh. I have to say like our original understanding of the brain was that certain parts of it were responsible for certain things. So like your prefrontal cortex like up here is kind of responsible for your decision-making processes, your personality. Um, also responsible for behaviors and then like your visual cortex which is kind of located in the back of your head is responsible for recognizing face and color and images i think now we're starting to realize that specific regions of the brain are not solely responsible for certain events and that the brain is kind of acting collectively i think there's a lot of research that still needs to be done to really understand you know is it this particular neural connection or these systems of neural connections that are responsible for a certain task? But I don't know if we really understand what, what part of the brain or if it's the whole brain or if it's you know a, a system of neurons that's responsible for you, know, you having negative thoughts or um, negative energy or emotions. So what originally drew you to the field of um, neuroscience or where did you first get started? I know you showed the book, um, yeah. an amazing resource, but before all that, how did you find yourself in Doing neuroscience? Yeah, absolutely. So I was always kind of fascinated by the brain. I mean, this is the, the organ that's responsible for who you are, how you identify. It's responsible for what you like and don't like, what you see and what you hear. And it's responsible on it also just to make sure that your entire body works. And I came to the realization as I was going through school, how little about the brain we actually knew and how much of the brain still needs to be studied. And so I really was fascinated by the challenge of trying to better understand the brain and the challenge of trying to go into a field where there's still very much a theoretical component, still very much, you know, a lot of questions that needed to be asked about the functionality of the brain. And so I got super excited about what I call the rabbit hole of neuroscience and drawn to the rabbit hole of neuroscience and decided to go and pursue, you know, a degree in neuroscience, both at, as my undergraduate and also as my grad school at training. With that said, I, as I came into, you know, maybe my postdoc fellowship after I finished my education, there was an explosion that happened in our ecosystem where a lot of computational biology, a lot of computer science, a lot of theory, a lot of understanding of molecular dynamics and mathematics was integrating into neuroscience and integrating into biology. And I just got very excited about merging the two fields together and merging the skills and the tools that we have in these other disciplines into biology and in neuroscience. And that kind of let me go and try to train on how to build neural networks, how to do theory, how to do surprisal analysis. And that offered that entire sort of window of tools to be able to understand the brain a little bit better. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. I can see Alan, he's talking about um, in the chat that, um, you know, a lot of different people are affected by COVID-19, things like feeling anxious and depression. And there's so many things that we can see. Um, and I think neuroscience is just one of many ways to kind of dig deeper into that puzzle. Mm -hmm. 
I see a few hands um, that have gone up. I think it's uh, Javier, and I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing anyone's names. Um, so maybe if we can go in the order of Javier, Alan, Deanna, and Dimitri. Uh, thank you. No, Javier is totally fine. Thank you. And thank you, doctor, for joining us today. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, as many people in this call, or maybe not many, but at least myself, identifying in the spectrum in the neurodiversity, um, uh, I understand that your field is um, more on the women, um, the um, women um, focus. But in general, I was wondering if you can share with us what has been the latest discoveries uh, from neuroscience that can uh, positively impact the life of people in the spectrum, particularly uh, high functioning? Um, and if you don't mind, a second question, if anything related to genetics and neuroscience that you have found in your career or in your studies, that would be also nice, uh, something that is of my particular interest, uh, genetics and implications uh, into uh, neurodiversity and yeah. any point of view from the neuroscience. Thank you. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, like my expertise is not, you know, um, autism or specifically the genetics behind high functioning autistic um, brains. But with that said, there are a body of literature that is emerging on trying to classify and understand, you know, the variability and the heterogeneity of patients that sit on the spectrum and, you know, how how different different sort of folks on the spectrum can be both from a both from a sort of a behavioral perspective as well as from a genetic and epigenetic perspective. But I think you know one body of literature that's emerging that's really kind of fascinating is the gut brain axis, so the microbiome in the gut and then as well as its connection to the brain and the unique gut microbiome of autistic patients. Um, there's a lot of genetic work that's being done in that space to be able to understand the modulations in the microbiome of people on the spectrum, how that affects their daily lives, and then also to try to understand how that affects their overall wellness as well as affects, you know, you know, where they sit along the spectrum or vice versa. I think that would be really kind of an interesting, you know, area if you are interested in genetics and the role of genetics in folks on the autistic spectrum that is emerging that's really exciting information of, you know, being able to modulate your bio and your diet and, you know, the bacteria, you have probiotics in your gut and seeing how that affects your overall wellness as a person of spectrum. Because we do know that one of the common, um, one of the common behavioral complaints of folks on the spectrum is digestive issues, you know, pain with their abdomen, bloating, and that kind of led people down to really understand the gut microbiome and saw some really interesting interactions between that, the, the microbes in the gut and the brain. I do know that there's a lot of um, genetic sequencing work that's being done in the space as well. Genetic sequencing in the last five years has seen also a, a huge explosion, mostly because it's driven that genetic sequencing has decreased in cost and so it's made it a lot more affordable for scientists to be able to sequence patients and to really understand genetic information, both on the cost perspective and also on the computing perspective to actually have the computing power to, to go through these massive amounts of data. So there's a lot of literature that's trying to go through and see if there are you know, genetic markets markers to target. The other thing that I think might be interesting for you is epigenetics. It's a field where it's very closely related to genetics, but it is instead of changes on the DNA and changes on genes specifically, these are modulations that sit on the outside of the genome that they're phosphorylated or methylated that allow opening or closing of different regions of the genome that allow it to be expressed or not. And they're finding really interesting signatures in the epigenetic side that may be linked to different folks on the spectrum or different subpopulations on the spectrum. Thank you, that's great. Sure, absolutely. And Alan? Uh, if you're there, did you have something you want to ask or share? Um, I just want to let you know that some people might have the anxiety and depression because of the COVID-19. And that's the only thing I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah. thank you. We definitely, we definitely have seen, you know, an uptake of, um, you know, some of these mental illnesses, some of these just debilitating mental fatigue and um, issues come up as a consequence of the stresses affiliated with this quarantine and the COVID and the fear around it. So, you know, we're incredibly conscious of it. And the company was founded in February, right before the quarantine. And our team definitely realized that the need for a wellness platform, for a video teleconferencing platform, one, to be able to address the need to be able to see, you know, um, an expert without having to physically interact with them or go to an office because of the spread of the virus. And then also, two, to recognize that people really needed help with their overall wellness and to be able to sit and be able to help resolve that pain point was one of the mission statements for us. I did have um, an inquiry from Brody, who I think he wanted to know a little bit more about um, schizophrenia and kind of where headaches come from in the brain. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. Awesome. Um, so schizophrenia, to my understanding, and remember, I'm not an expert in all of the neuropathologies, but to my understanding, it's a phenomenon where um, the mechanism of action hasn't really also been understood. I think there's a lot of multiple theories on where it may have emerged. I think there's also a lot of different theories on, um, on how to best treat it. But I think one of the interesting things that I've come across in my reading is the ability of using technology to be able to predict schizophrenic events before they happen or as they're happening. So one of the, the symptoms of schizophrenia, to my understanding, is this sort of multiple personality disorder. And it's hard for me to be able to truly articulate you know, that phenomenon. And I think even just calling it a multiple personality disorder, it may be unfair to the, to the, the true nature of the pathology. But there was a company that came across um, my desk not too long ago called Paratherapeutics that was doing some interesting things around using, um, using technology to be able to help schizophrenic patients and to be able to determine whether they're taking their medications or not taking their medications. One of the things that they did is they were looking at behaviors on, you know, on your phone, on your smartphone, and saw that you know there was kind of a routine pattern that a patient would have and if a patient who was diagnosed as schizophrenic moved away from that routine pattern that kind of alerted the company that something might be wrong if that patient might have a schizophrenic event so i think you know that's kind of my understanding of you know what i think is the 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 use of technology a really sophisticated use of technology for schizophrenic patients, but you know, to really answer the question of, do we truly know what the mechanism of action of schizophrenia is? I think most neuroscientists to say that there's still a lot that we need to be able to understand, and there's a lot that we need to be able to decipher both on the, you know, the whole brain level as well as on the molecular level, and we you know if we can pinpoint the, the source cause of schizophrenia. Um, but instead, I would rather just kind of point to the work that paratherapeutics done. I was like trying to be able to create and use technology to create a platform that schizophrenics can use to be able to, to manage their day to day lives. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, it is about, uh, this is more important. Is it okay to say this? I'm very curious about it. Can I say it? I think so. I mean, I, I, I don't see why not. <laughs> yeah, it's about AI. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, is it, is the AI advanced that so that, uh, so that computer can have fake voices? So, so like video channels like YouTube called uh, uh, Bright Side and Topic. Is it advanced that so that people could have face fake voices? So I, I think the question is, is, is AI got into a place where it can generate language? Is that yeah, the question? Yeah, like, like 
YouTube channels like Bryset and Topic? I think there's a lot of work that's being done in this space. You know, natural language processing, natural language generation has been a very interesting field within AI and there's a lot of work that's being done. And yeah, I think we're definitely moving towards a direction where we can do some really sophisticated things around language recognition and language generation and even, you know, getting to a point where different variances in in tone, different variances in accents, different variances in language, you know, composition itself is starting to be, you know, better understood and, you know, um, technologies are being developed that are a little bit more sophisticated than they ever were before. So I would have to say, yeah, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of nice advancements in AI that's also, related to speech generation. Also, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, what is it like to be a neuroscientist? What is it like to be a neuroscientist? I mean, it's, there are days that it's frustrating because you know, so little is still unknown about the brain and so little is unknown about how the brain works. And sometimes not having those answers is, can be really frustrating and really kind of agonizing. And there's sometimes that, you know, it's really exciting because you become a part of the process of uncovering, you know, some of these unknowns and uncovering some of these, you know, um, answers to hopefully answers to some of the questions that a lot of folks have been asking for a really long time. You know, being a neuroscientist was part of my journey as a scientist and I'm excited that my journey has taken me this route. And I definitely look forward to what the next, you know, five to 10 years of my career is gonna look like in this space. And if Deanna is good, maybe we'll come back for your question. Um, what I was wondering, how long does it take to become a neurologist or uh, neuroscientist? Neuroscientist, thank sure. you. <laughs> I was trying to think of the word. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, most require, you know, four years of an undergraduate degree and then anywhere between four to five years of a postdoctorate um, degree, uh, as a doctorate degree in a PhD in neuroscience or neuroengineering or cognitive science. And then a lot of us eventually go and do a fellowship after we get our PhD. So it can take anywhere from eight to 10 years huh. after high school to become a neuroscientist. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> it is a long time. And Dimitri? Oh, I'll join you. Um, 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 for, um, uh, like how do we, uh, um, like, how do we, like, I know that like, now, uh, uh, COVID-19, like, how do we, like, all cope with anxiety of COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, post-COVID-19, um, we're seeing that a lot of things have fundamentally changed. Anxiety and the treatment of anxiety, even though there's multiple ways of being able to do it both on a clinical front and on the wellness front, we have to kind of shift those capabilities on a digital and technology first perspective. You know, original wellness appointments that were in person or clinical appointments that are in person are moving more and more to be telehealth and virtual conferencing. And so, you know, managing anxiety in a, in a way that is very digital oriented, if you will, like this conference call or the Zoom call is taking some time to be able to develop so that you're delivering the same quality of care, the same empathy that's required and the same understanding. And then it's really hard, especially when some programs that are used to help manage anxiety require in-person kind of um, interactions to be able to get the same experience in person as you would digital conference. On the, on the flip side, you know, Patients that were apprehensive of visiting clinicians or walking out and going to clinics or walking out and going to wellness centers to help manage their anxiety are finding, um, some of them are finding that the telehealth component is allowing them to have easier access to, um, to care. So I think we're seeing some interesting things emerge in um, anxiety management. And I think post COVID and you know, the need to be able to social distance, the need to be able to eliminate human to human interaction in person 
or not eliminate, but to minimize. Mm -hmm. So you reduce the spread of the virus is, you know, really causing a lot of changes in the way that we're delivering care, both on the anxiety front and also on other fronts as well. So we'll see how that kind of like plays out in the next five to six years. Our company is really pushing a technology first wellness platform so that we can, we don't think the technology integration component of our lives and our delivery of healthcare is going away anytime soon. And COVID has just rapidly fast tracked the need for something like this. Um, so we're continuously using and developing something for this um, market. Uh, and also, um, what kind of services do you have, um, like for for adults for, for for this type of thing? So I think our company right now is really just focused on wellness for women. And this ranges anywhere from questions they may have about their overall wellness that we can try to best answer. We also deliver um, feminine hygiene products to women directly. And we are really kind of targeting low-income Medicare, Medicare, Cal women, um, Medicare, Medicaid women that otherwise have been forgotten by your ecosystem. And to make sure that they have access to healthcare that is affordable as well as access to wellness initiatives. This demographic generally comes from a mindset of I go to the doctor when I'm sick versus a wellness centered kind of approach to their healthcare. And so we wanna to try to be able to target their demographic and help them move from you know, going to the physician when they're sick to more of a wellness centered approach. I see we have um, some hands up and some questions from the chat. Um, so I know Dimitri, he also asked in the chat earlier, where he can get that book that you were holding yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, what was the book, book called again? Sorry. Uh -huh. uh, it's called um, Make Your Own Neural Network by Tara oh, yeah. Ruki. And um, it's available on Amazon. You can get it digitally downloaded or you can get the book itself. Oh. And in the chat, I know Eddie also had his hand up for a question. How's your day going? How's my day going? Yeah, thank you <laughs> for asking that. Talk Miss Dad or Dr. Zed. I mean, is that the question, how my day is going? I, I was wondering, may I please call you by Miss Dad or Dr. Zed? I mean, uh, absolutely, that's fine. I call you by, by Sohila, it's okay. Yeah, that's fine as well. You're a doctor. Where do you get PhD from? Where? Yeah, so um, I got my PhD from the University of Southern California. I'm muted. I know you. I know you. You. You look like thirty year old something. You got PhD. Uh yeah. So I'm thirty three years old. I Google your LinkedIn. I'm sorry. That's private. I Google your LinkedIn. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's private. And I see Rachel and Deanna also have, and um, Surya, Surya, I'm sorry, my pronunciations are, I'm working on it. So we have three hands up. Can we start with Rachel? Um, okay, hi, thank you for being here and thank you for taking questions. And I was just wondering, um, I know you have a company called Fanpatch Cult and I, I also know that um, in the description that you said you're engineering for the next generation of female health products. And I was just wondering like what those look like. Cause yeah, if you want to, I, I kind of have like a two part question. So um, yeah, if you want to answer that one. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the current feminine hygiene products, they haven't really changed in engineering or in structure since they were first patented in the 1930s and the 1920s. Mm -hmm. The tampon, which is used for you know, menstrual cycles, the original patent was put in place in the early 1930s. And if you pull the patents, the actual engineering design features are exactly the same. And so one of the things that our team is doing, because we were a very technically strong team, is trying to see if we can create more sophisticated technologies, you know, for 2020. For the tampon specifically, we're using alternative biofibers that we know are more absorbent, more eco-friendly, and to see if whether or not that can be used as a tampon derivative versus the traditional cotton-based tampon. So we are kind of working along those lines and creating sort of 
technologies in the women's health direct to consumer space that is a little bit different than you know your traditional tampon and women's health products that we have right now but it will take us yeah. time to be able to test to develop and then to be able to manufacture okay and um i was wondering if you've considered something like um like diva cups or like menstrual cups in um as a way like as another alternative for people yeah so we actually do give we do provide menstrual cups on our platform so we do have mental cups today on our platform that women can uh, to order and purchase okay cool yeah because i i know that um there has been a lot of concern with um especially like um i guess commercially produced like tampons and then there was like pesticide residues in tampons and that creates like toxic shock syndromes for people and right. so so then I know um, that you said that what you're producing is biofibers and um, I, I haven't read too much about it but um, does it like I guess like would it then have like a or a complete cycle of like decomposing on their own, like, and then like in the ocean, if people like flush it or like in right. landfills, yeah. Right, so for us, the biofibers still need a lot of testing to do. We do know that the biofibers that we're using, that we're testing are completely plant-based, they're biodegradable. Mm -hmm. The core difference between the biofibers that we're using and the biofibers that are available in like traditional cotton fibers is that the biofibers that we're using um, are more absorbent than cotton fibers are. Mm -hmm. And so the leaking component, the, you know, the, the, the part where you know, women have issues with you know, leaking of their, their menstrual fluid and the product not working, and the hope is that if we create a product that's more absorbent, that reduces the leaking, women would use fewer pads and fewer tampons because they're not changing it as frequently. Without said, the technology is very, very early. We still need to test to see how the fibers behave in the vaginal wall. We still need to test mm -hmm. to see you know, how it actually behaves um, from an absorbance perspective and to see what the maximum volume it would hold. So all of these testings still kind of need to be done. And then I think that kind of leads me to my like second question. Um, in your testing, so as a neuroscientist, do you also, because um, you would test like how it affects um, the, the ovary walls or like how your product affects ovary walls and then with how would you connect that to how it affects the brain? Because I also know that there's not a lot of research with female um, menstruation and the brain and the effect of um, using menstrual products and like how does that affect your hormone balance and and then how does that affect your brain in that sense and then your endocrinological stuff. So um, maybe if you want to touch on that or if you do research on that. Yeah, so I think there's a lot that that we think we understand on how the brain is related specifically to pituitary and sending out hormones for you to have a menstrual cycle and you know the dynamic behavior of the estrogens and progesterones mm -hmm. um, that sort of really kind of define the menstrual event as far as how the brain changes in delivering the signals to the body as you age there's still a lot that has to be known and we really don't understand the changes across time all we really know is that you know, at one point in time, you have your menstrual event and then your brain is sending these signals, follicle stimulating hormone to your ovary to shoot out an egg into the, into the uterus and it does this periodically on a monthly cycle. And then all of a sudden you go into like your late 40s, early 50s and this just kind of stops and we have no idea why that does and that's the onset of menopause that women experience. But you're right. I think there are some core understandings of how the brain regulates the menstrual event around women's health. And there's also some understandings that we just don't have yet around these dynamic changes and how they're influenced by environment, by diet, by genetics, and by age that we still need to be able to uncover. At this stage, you know, our company is not focused on understanding, you know, the, these dynamic hormone behaviors in the brain and how they influence the reproductive cycle. 
I think our focus really is, you know, trying to create a user and patient patient um, centered platform to be able to resolve the concerns that people experience today, women experience today first. Okay, thank you. Thank you so sure. much. And maybe we can go to um, Surya for our next question. Hi, um, so uh, Rachel already asked the question I want to ask. And so thank you for answering. <laughs> sure. Perfect. High efficiency. <laughs> and um, Deanna, she also had a question. Um, I have a, I, my, my sister, my sister-in-law has a grandson that has autism. Mm -hmm. And when he holds things, he shakes a bit. Do, would that affect the autism? Like of, of holding, say like a cup or a spoon or a fork and that? So if I think I understand the, correct, the question correctly, it's essentially asking me that a child that's on the autistic spectrum, when he holds things, he shakes as a consequence yes. of the spectrum or because he shakes them and that affects his autism. I, I think of what, what you were saying just there a minute ago. Okay, so um, honestly, I, I, without being able to like interact with the child, without being able to really understand or see the shaking, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to give you like a definitive answer. I mean, there are a lot of uh, repetitive behaviors that autistic um, patients sometimes on the spectrum, depending on where on their spectrum exhibit, mm -hmm. it could be one of the repetitive behavior traits. Um, and I'm sure that the parents have gone to clinicians to see if there's any motor issues, uh, cognitive motor issues. But unfortunately, without being able to witness the shaking event or witness the child or to observe the child, it's hard to be able to decipher what the problem is. And we have a question from the chat. Tamsin wants to know what kind of cool things are coming out in um, a come or in the future. Wow, okay. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff coming out of artificial intelligence. There's a lot of work that's being in healthcare that I described. Things like that um, schizophrenic app where you can determine if someone has a schizophrenic event before they, or as they have them um, using just their behaviors on the phone. I think there's a lot of kind of cool things that are happening in, um, in trying to understand how vision works, how to understand how natural image processing works. I think there's also a lot of cool things that are happening around consciousness on trying to see if we can understand the molecular science behind consciousness and see if we can create an AI that can do something like that. I mean, there is scientists that are actively trying to create conscious artificial intelligence. And there's a lot of work being done in robotics to create sophisticated robotics and friends um, that's driven by artificial intelligence that I think is really exciting. There's a couple of companies here in California that are doing something in that space. Yeah, I have a cousin in California who's uh, a course of roboticism, actually. I'm sorry, I missed that. What was that? He's taking a course in roboticism. Uh, he was in the Marines. Now he's, uh, now he's taking this course in roboticism. So. Uh, but I don't know, what would he become, a roboticist? Or how would that work if he were taking the course? What would he end up doing exactly? I mean, it will be interesting to see. I mean, I don't know what his background is, but a lot of folks that study, um, you know, mechanical engineering, study robotics, they build essentially robots. And oh. they can do things as simple as like, you know, um, a delivery robot or a packaging lifting robot to something more sophisticated as um, an actual robotic face, if you will. <laughs> and I don't know if this is fair to say, um, I know before you came on, uh, we talked a little bit about you being a venture capitalist in the Silicon yeah. Valley. And would it be fair to call you a serial entrepreneur? I think that's fair. I mean, I've done this enough to enough times to be called, I think, a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not 100 percent sure yet. So where have how come you've arrived um, for women's health and accessibility? 
Sure. So, I mean, I came from a very interesting background. I was a daughter of refugees and I firsthand understood some of the pain points around healthcare, specifically women's healthcare. And so as I went through my career, a part of me was always passionate about doing something disruptive in this space and really kind of addressing this demographic. And the core it, premise of the work that I do is to really go after this demographic and to change the way that they think about their own healthcare. I mean, to instead of moving them from a patient, uh, you know, I go to a, the physician when I'm sick to, no, I want to take more preventative, more proactive approach to my wellness. And so I think that is where, you know, my passions really lied. And I think the more that I started to dabble in the space, the more I realized that this is where I want to be. And this is where I want to be able to, to make the most difference. And so that's how I came to where I came. I think the journey on a whole has been, you know, very serendipitous and very non-traditional. But, you know, the journey is just as exciting as the end destination, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Tamsin wants to know in the chat, what are some of the other companies you started or advised for? Sure. So, you know, we've done a lot of work in, you know, skincare. We've built a company in the microbiome and skin space where we try to really understand how the bacteria on the skin behave and how it relates to acne. We've done a lot of work in the aging skin space. We've done work in the menopause space, creating a platform for menopausal women to be able to get products that are geared towards them, to get understanding and education that's geared towards them. So we dabbled in you know, different kind of sectors and the core sort of um, underlying denominator across the board has been leveraging technology and innovation technology to do something substantial in improving delivery of care, delivery of resources or delivery of products to a patient demographic. Thank you so much. And I know we're about to wrap up for today, um, but the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Maybe you can tell folks how they can get in touch with you or keep on following the work that you're doing. Absolutely. So, you know, it was an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, amazing question, super exciting to be able to share the work that I've been doing with you guys. And to be able to speak to a neurodiverse community, I think this is the first time that I ever spoke to a neurodiverse community. So this has been an amazing experience for me as well. Um, one way to be able to get in touch and to follow the work that we've done is, you know, following the work that um, Fempatch is doing. So we have an Instagram platform. Um, I think it's at Fempatch and Kudos, I think is one of the followers of the platform. We also have a website that we actively you know, post blogs around innovations in women's health that you guys can also follow. And then you can send us messages through Instagram or through our website to be able to get access to me or to someone from my team and happy to continue to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, it was my absolute pleasure. Thank you guys all for jumping on a call and listening to my work. and my experience and I'm happy to uh, continue the discussion offline as well.